Day one on the Peloponnese Trail and it feels like the whole day has been characterised by, uh, by railways. From the two trains that we had to take from Athens to get to the start to get to Diakostos, to the fact that today's route has followed this kind of narrow gauge mountain railway for the last 14 kilometres as it's carved this way through a canyon. For Lords of the Rings fans, just the presence of all this steel and rock and the causeways and the bridges built over the canyons. And it feels <laughs> ridiculous to say, but it feels like we're in dwarf country. The rock and pinion gauge in the middle of the railway is kind of like a sign that you could see that there was a steep bit approaching. And then as you could just make out the fact that you were coming to the end of it, you knew that it was going to be a bit that flattened off. So we started from the water's edge. We've climbed up now. We've got maybe half an hour left to go of today. And then we get to our accommodation on the first night. This limestone cast landscape has already been incredible. And the simplicity of following a railway line has meant that your mind's just been able to relax and wander and go on its own little journey as our legs have taken us up the hill. So if yesterday was all about rock faces, trains, and the role of steel and aging iron on the landscape, then keeping with that Tolkien theme, today we've moved from the dwarf strongholds to the woodland realms of the elven folk. It's all been about ducking under tree branches, following little tingle tracks, and just enjoying just the sound of the chirping birds breathing in that hyper-oxygenated air. Oh, in stark contrast to being bleached by the sun and popping in and out of tunnels yesterday, today it's all been about shady groves, watching out for the roots underfoot, and just enjoying the sounds and the smells of being in a forest. After nearly four hours and about a thousand meters of ascent, kind of up out of the trees now, up onto the plateau, just kind of alpine terrain, heading towards a ski area. You can see the snow on the mountains in front of us. And we've gone from our single track little trails to then not really having a trail at all, trying to find our own way, make our own way through the woods, to now following what in winter might even be like a little, little ski cat track. And now over this plateau and then we start our descent down to where we're staying this evening. It's been glorious. Get 
So day three, me and Hammy, we navigate using a mixture of a guidebook and an online map that Ben has on his phone, which is really good, um, that we can access on airplane mode, which is also really good. Although signals were pretty good, so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, today will be our first day camping, which is exciting. We stayed in hard accommodation the past two nights. My legs hurt a lot of elevation yesterday, but in a good, satisfying way. Ooh, let's find out where we're going next. We'll see. Here he comes. Since we found ourselves up in the Alpine when we broke out of the fir trees on day two, we've mostly been following the trails that make up the E4. The E4 is part of this trans-European network of trails, sort of sense of unity and identity, something that we all share through recreation, so it's something that crosses beyond borders and, and connects all of us together. What that's meant practically though is that we've had little signs with little E4 triangles on them telling us which way to go, the occasional painted rock indicating the direction. But it also means that we've been down from the mountains a little bit, following along routes along the valley, snaking along paths of rivers. It's been a bit more solitary, a little bit quieter, a lot more peaceful. It's a far cry from the railway track to day one and where we began by the seashore. So in the United States, there are these kind of big, massive through hikes that people do. The Pacific Crest Trail and the Continental Divide and the Appalachian Trail. And it's built of its own internal vernacular, its own language. And so they have PUDs, these pointless up and downs. Well, I'm gonna coin for the E4 and for this bit in particular, PSEs, pointless spiky experiences where for like no discernible reason, the architects of the E4 and the Peloponnese Trail look at this wonderful wide open mountainside or this beautiful meadow and go, you see those spiky bushes? That's where the route should go. Bang through the middle of them. And to hell with what happens to people's arms, their legs, or anything on the outside of their rucksack, because that is fair game for those spiky experiences. Big mountain days. There's always a lot of up. So after a casual 800 meters of up, then once you got a little bit, little bit steep in sections, we kind of popped out above the tree line again into the Alpine. We found that little ski resort that we were told about. Seems weird to call a ski resort seasonal. Surely their default mode is being seasonal. Like if it's not winter, it can't really be a ski resort. But I understand what they mean. It's at like a low altitude and it's, it's sort of a small one. The kind of one that you'd mostly use if you're a local resident or if you're somewhere just, just popping down for the weekend from living nearby. So we're up over the Alpine, gonna pop down the other side, down into Gararis, and then that'll be us for today. A little bit more time among the pine trees. It's the morning of day nine on the Peloponnese Trail. We're in Laconia now, we've left Arcadia behind, and we're now in the province, the region of the, uh, the ancient city of Sparta. And all of the positive and negative impacts that it's had on like physical culture and proto-fascism. We left Vanvaku, the, the village that's going through its project of renewal. And we followed the path of this river for about an hour and a half, 
two hours. It's slow going, but it's wonderful to follow like little unmarked single track paths through the woodland. We got the tent up just before it rained and it rained heavily for a couple of hours, which means we're now carrying a, a rather heavier, wetter tent case around, but that's okay. We're continuing to follow this river now until we uh, we reunite with our much beloved signposted e because we took a little bit of a detour to get to Van Baku. And now we're in, I don't know, geography is interesting, like an outflow of the river. It's wide, there's loose terrain everywhere, there's kind of boulders, there's evidence of fluvial activity, so it's been, it's been affected by the river, it's been moved by the river, it's been carved into lots of into weaving and braided channels, but it's hard to imagine just snow melt being enough to do this. At the same time, I'm walking on what is quite clearly <laughs> a Jeep track. Vehicles come this way, and vehicles come this way in a way that they've compressed the ground so much that the river can't dig the rocks back up, so I don't know, it's like a misfit river. What I'm seeing doesn't fit with the features that are around me but I guess that's one of the wonders of geology and geography. It tells a story of a landscape's past, much like the ruins, of the water mills that we saw yesterday, that speak to how people would have once used this valley and how that's different to how they use it now. Still, onwards into Laconia. So it rained all day yesterday. That's okay, because we knew it was coming. It meant that we left Sparta, walked about six kilometers along a road, and into Mistress, which, if you ever come, Mistress is a lot nicer than Sparta. <laughs> it doesn't have piles of trash flowing down the streets. We kind of moved our days around as well to account for the rain. Power of modern technology, meaning we get up-to-date weather forecasts, and we know what's coming. So the day before it rained, we pushed for about 30 kilometers from where we camped near Van Baku all the way down to Sparta. Then yesterday in the rain, just a short distance, then we dried everything back out. And now today we're stringing together what amounts to about two days of our guidebook, plus a little bit more, as we head from Mistress all the way up into these mountains, past a hut belonging to the Spartan Mountaineering Club and to what we hope is going to be a bothy. Well, who knows? Might even play a little bit of Martin Bennett. Get some bothy culture. So we spent our night out in our Greek bothy. I forgot to put any Martin Bennett on, but you know, we brought some good quality bothy culture to that place. <laughs> Lit a nice big fire, kept going to about three in the morning. And I get that there's, there's questions over manageable uses of, of forests, the extent to which we can, we can burn things, the question to which we should be using firewood. I don't know, in terms of forestry management, to the best of my understanding, I'm always ready to be corrected on the best of my understanding. But to the best of my understanding, the dry wood littering the forest floor is one of the primary causes of fires that quickly rage to be out of control. So if we do a small part to help manage that by reducing, reducing the quantity of dry wood that's lying on the floor, from what I'm told, I'm doing my part to help reduce the risk of big forest fires being an occurrence. How true that will stay on a warming planet? Hard to say. Still, we spent our night in the Bothy. We're heading on now to Arna. Short day today, should be about five or six hours. We head up for the first hour, get to a big pass, go by a couple of isolated, remote, orthodox churches, and then it's, it's a long descent down to a village where there should be a hot meal waiting for us. 